can go down to CNET and other news sites and get news ranked by date because for news you want information that's the most recent information available. But I really want to show you my favorite which is shopping on the internet. I don't know about you but I've started to buy a lot of things over the web and every website works differently. And what you want is a simple way to search on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and Buy.com and eToys but it all works with one simple interface. Well now you have that with Sherlock 2. Let's look for Sherlock Holmes and I've selected books. Books at Amazon, at Barnes and Noble, at Buy.com. Again, when I say search, Sherlock is going to go out to those e-commerce sites, gather the information about books that relate to Sherlock Holmes, bring it all back to me in one simple interface, and now the information is relevant to buying, which is the name of the item, the price that it is, and the availability, how fast can I get that item? Because that's what you want to know when you're shopping. It's so easy, it's just a single click and you get access to all these e-commerce sites. And again, I can pick one, The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, on Amazon. It's $2.39, available in two to three days. Double click, and I go straight to that page on Amazon.com. All I have to do is click on the shopping cart and add it to my shopping cart and be ready to buy. Now that's for purchasing goods like books or movies or CDs. We can also look at auctions. So let's go back and let's turn on Amazon auctions. I think a few people out there use the auction sites and eBay. And now let's reach out and find anything to do with Sherlock Holmes that's up for auctions. And again, it comes right back, starts to present the data to us. You see the name of the item, the price. Yeah, the first one up there, one cent. One cent. I think you can get in on that. And availability. Now availability is really great because on the auction it's not how fast it takes to get to you. On an auction site it's how long is it still up for auction. So let's go look at that one. Two paperbacks for a penny. It's still open for five days. Well, let's sort it the other way. $250 I can go get an item called Sherlock Holmes and the House of Fear. But I'm on a budget. Let's go to that penny one. And sure enough, we go right to the auction site, right to the item. We can read all about it, learn all about it, about the books available for a penny, and join that auction. And then I can keep in Sherlock and keep tracking it. Yep, pretty funny. So I can keep track of it and know when it's available. So that's Sherlock. With Sherlock, you can search the web for people, search for news, search for items you want to buy, track auctions, all in one simple interface and get instant access to everything you want. And that's just one of the internet power tools. Steve mentioned a few others. Let me show you some of them. We're going to log out. We've been working just like my Mac does every single day. Only now I can log out and I'll see a panel that allows me to log in as different users. I was actually logged into Steve's area where we were doing that demo of Sherlock 2. Let's log into my area and see some of the differences. Now when I do this, I'm going to actually do a voice print log on. Now, for those who work with voice, you know how risky it is to on stage with microphones and speakers and people do voice print because it's using biometric feedback to measure my voice. But let's try it anyway. It's such a cool feature. Now, when I click log on, it's going to prompt me for a passphrase. You can pick your own passphrase. I'm going to speak it and it's going to measure my voice. My voice is my password. Great. It worked. Now, as I use my voice to log into the computer, everything's changed. My desktop patterns changed. My font preferences have changed. The applications I can access have changed. The documents have changed. Even all my internet settings. My browser selected. My ISP settings are set up. My email password set up. It's all set up, ready to go for me as opposed to another user. And I can protect information from other users seeing it. I can obviously protect things in my documents folder. It keeps Phil's document folder open only to me. But let's say someone still got around everything and got onto my system. Well, now I can use file encryption built into the operating system. Here's a photograph, surprise vacation, picture of the Eiffel Tower. Let's say I don't want anyone to know where we're going on vacation. I want to encrypt that file and hide it from prying little eyes. I go up to the file menu and just say encrypt. And macOS is going to ask me to create a key, a password, that will protect this file. I'm going to type in a password and not tell any of you. And I'm going to turn off a little checkbox down there called
called add to the keychain. And I'll show you how that works later. So we encrypt the file. It's now encrypted. It's got a key on it. If anybody tried to get onto my system and access this file, they double click. It's going to ask them for a key phrase. It's going to ask them for that keychain. I'll just type in something different now. Different. It's not supposed to work. So if anyone knows that. Oh, it didn't work. Great. So that's not supposed to work. Sometimes the best demo is one that doesn't work. Okay, now let's type in the real password. We'll decrypt it, it automatically opens it, and now it's available to me again. So it's that easy to use encryption. Now let's try it with that extra feature I told you about. Let's go and encrypt it, and I'm going to add my password, and I'm going to leave it checked to add it to my keychain. I'll encrypt that file. It's now encrypted. You get on the system, you can't open it. I send it to someone, they need to enter the password if I've provided them the password. But because I'm logged on with my voice, I've opened up my keychain and all my files and all my preferences for the keychain with the passwords and IDs, when I double click on it, it just automatically unlocks it and opens it. So only I can get into it once my keychain is open. So that keychain is very, very powerful. Let me show you how it looks. The keychain keeps track of all my personal information that I add to it. Access numbers to servers, to websites, to bank accounts I want to keep track of, and it's all encrypted in a very secure data encryption so people can't pry into that keychain file and get access to all that data. Let me show another way that the keychain helps us. I'm going to open one of the other internet power tools, the network browser. With the network browser, I can now have instant access the HTTP servers, FTP servers, LDAP directories, anything I use to find standard servers out there in the internet. And I've created an, I an icon right here for my own home network. This is actually going out over TCP IP. I'm going out over the internet. I'm going to access a machine, Phil's iMac at home, double click on it. You see its drive there. I'm going to launch it, and it's now mounted the hard drive from my home machine over the internet with a standard Mac look and feel. It doesn't feel like a web page or a browser. It just opens right to my desktop. And there's a password on that, and it's stored in my keychain. And automatically in the background, the keychain's allowed me to have access to it, unlock it, and get onto my folders at home. All automatically, all with a standard, simple Macintosh user interface. So accessing files over the internet with other Macintoshes can be just as easy as working with them on your local hard drive. So that's a little look at encryption, at the network browser and the keychain. I have one last set of demos I'd like to show you, and something just like Sherlock that in and of itself is worth, worth the entire upgrade, and that's the software updates. It's incredibly powerful. What I have here is a hard drive, a hard drive that's plug and play. And I'm going to take that hard drive and I'm going to plug it into my Macintosh. And it will now power up and spin up the hard drive. And a new dialog box comes up and it says, I don't have the driver for this hard drive. I think many of you have experienced something like this in the past. Now you have to go fish and hunt up a CD drive, a CD or something. No, not anymore, because it's asking, do you want to look for this over the internet? Let's click OK. And what it's done, it's gone out to a secure Apple server, and it's looked to see if Apple has a, drive, a driver for that device, found it for us, and when I click install, it's going to download and install in one step the driver I need.